Tangier, Morocco's famous port city. Since the Madrid bombings last March, Tangier is no longer a place where East and West happily meet. The city is now known as Morocco's capital of radical Islam. Basically, the army of jihad here in Morocco is, is much more uh, motivated than in other countries, in other Arab countries. Most of the Moroccan suspects in recent terrorist attacks have ties with this place. One of the most important is Amer Azizi. He's the subject of several arrest warrants, but remains on the run. He was charged only last April in Spain for his alleged role in helping plan the September 11 attacks on the US. He's also wanted by the Moroccan authorities for the Casablanca attacks in May last year. And now the Spanish police also want him for his role in coordinating the March 11 bombings in Madrid. We're on our way to Tlet el Hanimiyin, Amer Azizi's home village, 70 kilometers outside Casablanca. We're off to meet Amer Azizi's old friend, Si Mohammed. He remembers Azizi as a westernized reggae music lover and drug taker. Just before we leave, he tells us he cannot believe that his friend Azizi could turn into an Islamic terrorist. In his late teens, Azizi left for Spain. Si Mohammed believes it was during his stay in Spain that his friend embraced radical Islam. When he first arrived in Spain, Azizi spent much of his time among the small-time drug dealers and petty criminals in Barrio del Pilar, a dropping point in Madrid for most Moroccan migrants, legal or not. Pero si ha dado un cambio de 90 grados, tío, 
Later on, Amer Azizi began to pray at the Islamic Cultural Center in Madrid. The mosque recently came under scrutiny. Many suspects in the Madrid bombings were regulars here. But the Imam, Dr. El Masiri, is now trying to distance himself from the events. Azizi became a regular at the mosque, and in the late 90s, it was clear his religious beliefs had become more radical. In June 2000, he interrupted a memorial service for the late Syrian president, Hafez al-Assad, who, fundamentalists argue, betrayed Islam. Mosque spokesperson Mohammed El Afifi. After the falling out, Azizi left this congregation to seek out more radical Islamic prayer halls. This is where he started to mingle with the more extreme elements of the Madrid Muslim community. It was during that time that Azizi became active in terrorist circles. Dateline has a copy of Spain's major anti-terrorism report written by Judge Baltazar Garçon. In these 600 pages, Aziz is mentioned frequently. Scores of phone calls with Abu Dada, the alleged leader of Spain's Al-Qaeda cell, are summarized. They make it clear that Azizi wasn't just a foot soldier. He was Abu Dada's right-hand man. Terror attack in the heart of Madrid. Several bombs tear through commuter trains, killing more than 60. Four months after the carnage, the identity of the mastermind is still unclear. But investigators are convinced of Aziz's involvement. The Spanish government is, is, is today um, trying to draw links and to, 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 to understand the, 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 the full picture. The full picture includes Azizi. Jean-Charles Brizard is an independent intelligence consultant brought into the Madrid inquiry because he's the lead investigator for the 9-11 lawsuit. He says Azizi had been in frequent contact with many of the Madrid bomb suspects in the weeks leading up to the bombings. One of the more important is Jamel Zougam, a Moroccan arrested two days after the March 11 tragedy in Madrid. So what evidence have you got of his potential involvement in, in March 11? Um, the evidence is, is um, frequent contacts very soon prior to, to March 11 with uh, several of the suspected individuals in, this, in these bombings, including Zougan. By contacts, you mean phone contacts or yes, physical contacts? Yes, phone contacts, phone yes. Contact. Um, we, we also know that um, he, um, as far as I know, he, he also came physically uh, to meet several individuals in, in Morocco and uh, in Spain. Before March 11? Yes, before March 11. Um, and it is suspected that these contacts were made um, precisely for the, for the March 11 moment. Aziz's connections to terrorist circles were not limited to Spain, but extended to Al-Qaeda cells in Germany and the Middle East. I believe that Azizi uh, is, is close from, from several uh, entities that are 
at least it's, it's our assessment today, are relating to, to one and single um, network, a terrorist network, which is the network of, of Zarqawi. Abu Musab al-Zarqawi is the man the Americans hold responsible for the beheadings and recent wave of terrorism in Iraq. And Azizi is believed to have joined the ranks of Zarqawi's insurgents. To try and understand how an ordinary Moroccan boy could turn into one of Europe's most wanted terrorists, we tracked down Azizi's mother in the field near the family house back in Azizi's home village. Abdelaziz is Amer Aziz's elder brother. He tells us about Aziz's early life, a tough one given that he was raised without either parent. In the late 80s, Azizi, now almost 20, left for Spain and lost contact with his family for seven years. When he came back, he brought a friend with him, a Spanish man called Jose. Investigator Jean-Charles Brizard says the Spanish man in question is none other than José Galán González, or Yusuf Galán, another important Al-Qaeda operative. Yusuf Galan is, is, is important in the, in the Al-Qaeda cell. He's the one who makes the link with, um, with Jamia Islamia, and especially with um, um, someone named uh, Palin Dungan, usually referred as Palin in the, in the, by, by these individuals. Palin Dungan Siragar is an Indonesian. He's the commander of an Islamic military training camp in Poso on the Indonesian island of Sulawesi. And Yusuf Galan used to send him new recruits. One of them was Moroccan Amer Azizi. Uh, so in this document, um, uh, which is part of the um, investigation, the first Al-Qaeda cell, which was dismantled in Spain, we can see that other individuals uh, were attending this camp, and uh, they mentioned Amer Azizi. Uh, According to this document, details found in the camp's registry prove that Azizi trained in Poso for some time. When they searched Azizi's flat in Madrid, the police found three maps of Poso and a copy of a letter addressed to Yusuf Galan. The author is Palindungan Siragar. In the letter, Siragar appeals for money. Right now we need funds to carry out the jihad. Today we will have to return ten homemade rifles, of the better ones, because we don't have money to pay for them. Each costs 10,000 pesetas, and if we have the rifles, we don't have the bullets. You people can do a lot for us here. For just five million pesetas, we could buy a 200 hectare island that could be very useful. But our main need right now is weapons. The presence of this letter in Aziz's flat convinced the Spanish police of his direct involvement in raising funds for the Indonesian camp. It wasn't long before Amer Azizi had gone from foot soldier to fundraiser and then recruiter himself. 
Guinea? Well, he's, he appears in the in the investigative files as as the one uh, involved in the, in in the preparation and the recruitment of people to be trained in in, in Indonesia. Yes. Towards the end of 2001, Azizi was under 24-hour surveillance by the Spanish police. This was part of Operation Detil, a sweep against radical Islamic circles ordered by Judge Baltazar Garçon. While Abu Dada and Yusuf Galan did not manage to escape the dragnet, Azizi did. Jose Manuel Sanchez Fornet is the secretary general of the biggest police union in Spain. He believes Spanish intelligence blew the cover of the police surveillance on Azizi. The terrorist attacks have not just left intense personal grief in Spain. They've exposed an extraordinary lack of coordination between intelligence agencies within Spain and in the region. Um, it's true that almost uh, more than the half of the, of the individuals involved in this in the Spanish cell that committed the March 11 bombings was known before uh, by at least five countries in Europe plus Morocco. Um, some warnings were, were sent. These warnings were in connection with individuals, not with specific plots or potential plots. Um, it's true that, that these, most of these warnings were, were ignored as such. Uh, because they intervened uh, just right after uh, the, the May 2003 bombings in Casablanca. And uh, I've been told, and, and it was said, I think, that um, most of these warnings were put uh, under the global denomination of, you know, um, Moroccan paranoia. This dismissal of intelligence warnings as paranoia is particularly galling to the Moroccans. They feel they've been unfairly blamed for exporting terrorism to Europe. On reproche au Maroc d'avoir exporté et on n'arrive même pas à contrôler ce qui se passe dans leur pays. C'est grave ça. Et quand The voice on this recording is from Morocco's top anti-terrorism intelligence officer. For security reasons, he cannot be identified. He allowed this recording on a dictaphone in his office. He denies Morocco's responsibility in the bombings. Tous ces gens-là sont partis en Espagne. Complètement Back in Amer Aziz's home village, a similar sense of disbelief and even denial prevails. Moroccans simply refuse to be tarred with the label of terrorism. Bravo.